So friends, good morning. Uh, we start from what we have left last time. Uh, just uh, hurriedly, we can uh, recollect what we were intended to do. If you just recall, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, in quantum mechanics, there were there are only few problems which can be exactly solved without employing any approximations. But the rest of all the type of problem needs special technique or you can say some approximate method to solve the problem. And one of the method which we have started learning is the perturbation theory. And in that also restricting only to time independent problem, we have developed a theory uh, in, the, in the form of a series, which we call the perturbation series. The basic assumptions involved in this theory uh, are as follows. First, that your Hamiltonian is time independent. And being an independent Hamiltonian, obviously the energy uh, states which we will come across are also stationary. They will also not change with respect to time. Uh, second assumption which we have made, which is a more uh, uh, important assumption, is that the total Hamiltonian should be able to decouple, it should be able to split into perturbed part and the unperturbed part, out of which the perturbed part we assume to be very small compared to unperturbed part, and unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian is exactly solvable problem. So how this idea of decoupling your problem into the exactly solvable problem plus slight modification that can be introduced due to the perturbation that is the idea we try to learn and that's how we have developed a series uh, in, in fact that series uh, given by the great mathematician Rayleigh and Schrodinger so we have followed this Rayleigh and Schrodinger theory and this total Hamiltonian edge uh, can be written as a sum of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, which we usually write as a H0 symbol, and H prime, we write as uh, the perturbation or the perturbed part, then we are actually writing now series for the uh, energy eigenvalue W and the energy eigenstate V in the form of this, uh, in, in the power series of this lambda term. And don't forget this lambda by name, we call it as a strength parameter because this uh, lambda. Eventually, finally, we will write as a 1. But when it ranges between 0 and 1, it tells you that how much amount of perturbation you are including in your description. But of course, at the end, we will always take our lambda equals to 1. And then solving our new or the modified uh, energy eigenvalue equation, hv equals to wv, where h is now written as h0 and h this. And then we use this series expansion technique, the power series expansion, then for a different orders, for a different powers of lambda, we have now collection of three equations. First equation here, it is uh, known as the zeroth power or the zeroth order term. Second is the first order term, third, second uh, order term, and so on and so forth. These three equations are actually uh, are forming the perturbation theory, or you can say it is the perturbation series. And we started learning that first we try to solve our zeroth power term, which is in fact exactly solvable problem itself, because it is like H0 V0 uh, equals to W0 V0 is nothing but your H0 UN EN UN. As I have mentioned, that the un, this uh, unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian is uh, exactly solvable. So we know everything about this energy eigenvalues EN, and we also know. Uh, everything about the eigenstate un. So based on this unperturbed energy eigenvalues and unperturbed energy eigenstate, we are now developing a theory. And in that, first we try to obtain the first order theory for the perturbation. But before we jump into the mathematical uh, formalism for the first order, we should also realize that this v0, which is the zeroth order uh, state function, that can be of two types. It can be non-degenerate or it can be even degenerate. And firstly, we wander over to the non-degenerate case that is your V0 can be uniquely, can be in a only one way defined and that we write as a state UM. 
just to remind you small v and capital w symbol are reserved for the total hamiltonian including perturbation whereas small u and capital e these symbols are reserved for the unperturbed part that is related to the h0 term or h0 operator right so we have developed this theory to the first order we have done some mathematics we have applied the scalar product technique and when eventually we write this uh, uh, equation when we solve this equation what we have understood is that this w1 the first order correction to the energy eigenvalue is nothing but the expectation value of h dash where h dash or h prime is the perturbed part of the hamiltonian but this h dash uh, matrix element is computed using eigen function eigen state um and don't forget um is already known so states are already known h dash if you know then you can actually obtain this w1 simply by uh, considering the expectation value so this is a very simple mathematics in fact today when we are taking one example you can actually feel it that yes indeed this is a very simple way you can actually calculate the energy eigen value and once we have computed this w1 that is the energy eigen value then we are also able to calculate the energy eigen state function v1 you can see here this energy state function that we have calculated so if i summarize if i just now mix up the things if i write the total energy w total eigen state v combining unperturbed and the perturbed part then you can see up to the first order term up to the first order correction my w will be written as em you can see here em is nothing but the energy due to unperturbed hamiltonian plus that matrix element which i was mentioning for the h prime that you add so you get the total energy after including the effect of perturbation similarly the state function v can also be written you can see there's a one minus some term so ultimately it is this amplitude part this magnitude is now uh, changing but the state remains un only un means it is the eigen state corresponding to unperturbed hamiltonian at zero which is already known so we have developed this theory up to first order now we try to apply this theory to a practical problem or the experimental uh, problem and for that today we start with the one example uh, which we call as the harmonic oscillator and for this enharmonic oscillator how this first order perturbation theory can be useful that we try to investigate first but before we do the calculations we should realize that where such enharmonic oscillator can be observed is there any real system or is there any practical examples where you can have such enharmonic oscillators and answer is yes we have studied in a say uh, in a lower standard about say uh, spectroscopy atomic spectra and molecular spectra and even in the molecular spectra you have divided further into the different types of spectra like electronic spectra vibrational spectra rotational spectra or maybe band spectra or line spectra so this entire spectroscopy based on atoms and molecules if you just go back to the real uh, potential energy curve for this atoms and molecules then it will look like this what i have shown beside this cap, uh, this black color line you can see continuous line that is the typical nature typical type of graph which this uh, diatomic molecule or say atom uh, interaction between the atoms they have a uh, potential energy like this so if i just look at this graph the continuous line graph that is known as the potential energy graph or the potential energy as a function of distance as a function of separation between atoms or the molecules that i have plotted so vr basically indicates the potential energy r is the separation between two atoms or two molecules and we know that at a equilibrium at r equals to r0 in the figure where potential energy is lowest potential energy is minimum at that point your atoms or the molecules will remain stable you can say it is the equilibrium distance at which the force is zero the potential energy is minimum and your system will be in a stable condition so we know that practically there are examples where 
uh, your potential energy can be of this type, can be of this nature. Now, just look at the region close to this equilibrium where my cursor is moving. You can see this part which I try to darken, which I try to show with the bold uh, part. You can see this close to this R0 value. Your graph is it's looking like a parabola. In fact, I tried to show the complete parabola with a broken line or the dashed line. You can see this lower part or this part close to R0. You are here, you can see it is exactly parabola. <clears throat> and you know that this uh, parabola, if you just look at the equation of parabola, it is something like Ax square. <clears throat> so what is the idea that this part close to R0, which resembles the parabola, which is actually half kx square or the quadratic equation, quadratic term, that actually determines the h0 part of the problem. So in order to understand that how this broken line part, which is also known as a harmonic part, is being now utilized to develop a theory for the actual problem, for the actual diatomic system, or you can say atomic and molecular spectroscopy. That is what we try to understand. So indeed, there are examples, it's a single example which I try to show where this theory of perturbation is directly applicable and using it, you are able to calculate the energy eigen spectra of the atomic uh, system or for a molecular system or even for some complex system which we'll try to understand. So this is the problem, the graph indicates the uh, basic idea and that graph now I try to convert into the mathematical equation. So once I have a mathematical equation, I can play with that mathematical equation and I can finally obtain the energy correction or energy eigenvalue corrected up to the first order in perturbation. So I start writing now total Hamiltonian of this uh, diatomic system or atomic system, whatever you name it. So for this system, the total Hamiltonian is written and you know that total Hamiltonian is always the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. And if you write the operator correspondence, then this P, the linear momentum operator can be written or can be replaced by minus I H cut nebula. So if I square it, so I will have now minus H cut square nebula square by 2M. And if I restrict this problem to be in one dimension only, then uh, you will have only one coordinate, only one variable. So my kinetic energy term will look like this minus H cut square by 2M d square by dr square it is only the second order differential equation that we obtain whereas for this potential energy v of r that i tried to write in the uh, in the series form say i'm using this uh, taylor series about this equilibrium point correct so this r0 which is my equilibrium where energy potential energy is minimum that is the point about which now I apply Taylor series. So V of R is now expanded, is written uh, as Taylor series. So you can see this is a V of R0 means it is the value of potential at R equals to R0. Then the first order term, which is like 1 by 1 factorial del V by del R, R minus R0. And then I have written also the higher order terms, quadratic terms, the uh, cubic term and the cubic term, fourth power term and so on and so forth. So the total potential energy V of R can be written using this uh, uh, series. And then you know that this V of R0, which is actually a constant term. So if I take this constant term on the left hand side, then Vr minus constant, that term I write as a V effective. Right? Because it's a constant, only one value. So this V of R minus this constant term, which I will call as a V effective R. And then I know that at R equals to R0, at this point, when you are obtaining the uh, first differentiation, and don't forget differentiation means basically in a graphical way, it is the slope of the curve at that point. So when I find a slope of this V of R curve at R equals to R0, it will give the horizontal line. And you know that if the slope is, uh, uh, if the graph is horizontal, the slope is zero. So this term del V by del R actually will be zero when evaluated at R equals to R zero. So this slope will be zero. The first term will contribute zero. And for the rest of the term, now I use some symbols to make it a small expression. This term del square V by del R square, second differentiation with respect to R 
for potential energy that i will call as a small k and this small k is nothing but your famous uh, force constant and you know that in the theory of simple harmonic oscillator this force constant we can write as m omega square that we will see so this del square v by del r square term i will write as small k and wherever this r minus r0 is appearing that i will write as x then the second term will look like as a half kx square correct so 1 by 2 factor is 1 by 2 so it's a 1 by 2 kx square that is the second term similarly this is a 1 upon 3 factorial along with this the third uh, differentiation of potential energy del cube v by del r cube that i call as small a and this r minus r0 cube term i can write as x cube so i have now uh, total or the effective potential is something like half kx square plus ax cube plus bx raised to 4 and uh, higher order terms but just for doing the calculation i restrict myself only to the quadratic term only the fourth power term then my effective potential can be written as half kx square plus ax cube plus bx raised to 4 now just think that if your a and the coefficient this a which is known as a cubic force constant b the cubic force constant all of them are zero like cubic term is zero fourth power term is zero fifth power term is zero and so on and so forth then you are left with only one term that is half k x square so if i have plotted the graph of v as a half k x square then you know that this half k x square means a perfect parabola then my result would be something like a dashed the line you can see this dashed line which is shown in the graph with a blue in pen that is nothing but the perfectly parabolic graph corresponding to half k x square term and you know that this half k x square if i substitute in the expression for the hamiltonian then kinetic energy plus half k x square as a potential energy then this is nothing but the exactly solvable problem of simple harmonic oscillator right so this term half k x square i can call as the harmonic part of the potential it is the harmonic term whereas this higher order terms x cube bx raised to 4 c x raised to 5 so on and so for all those terms if i write then they are not harmonic something not harmonic so i may call non harmonic or they are actually representing n harmonic term. so the deviation from parabola you can see here just follow my cursor you can see from this point up to this it is all parabola but now the total graph is going like this it is not going upward like a parabola so can i say that this part the bending or the away deviation from harmonic part is corresponding to is due to this n harmonic terms it is due to this ax cube term and bx raised to 4 and all those terms so actually my total potential energy for any atom atom interaction or for molecular interactions this vr that can be written as a sum of this harmonic term plus all other terms if i call commonly as a an harmonic term then my total potential energy is now splitted is written as a sum of harmonic plus and harmonic terms so using this effective potential in the expression of hamiltonian here in this first equation my total hamiltonian can be written like this so minus h cut square by 2m d square by dx square because you know that now everything here r minus r0 i am writing as a x so my kinetic energy operator is also written as a in terms of x coordinate so my hamiltonian will look like this minus h cut square by 2m d square by dx square plus half k x square term this two terms i am keeping in a one bracket because i know that that will constitute the hamiltonian of a uh, simple harmonic oscillator remaining all uh, terms in fact i am keeping only two terms cubic term and quadratic term so remaining this two terms ax cube and bx4 that actually constitute the additional part to the hamiltonian harmonic oscillator hamiltonian and which i will call as h prime or h dash so obviously this method has allowed me to separate the hamiltonian into two parts one which is the h0 corresponding to simple harmonic oscillator term whereas this part ax cube and bx raised to 4 that is 
uh, actually showing the slight modification and you know that any modification in hamiltonian we may call as the perturbation so this ax cube and bx raised to 4 this actually constitute the perturbed part of the hamiltonian h prime if you remember the very basic assumption uh, in the perturbation theory is that you should be able to divide your hamiltonian into two parts unperturbed part and perturbed part that is now achieved you can see this simple harmonic oscillator problem this h0 which is the unperturbed hamiltonian exactly solvable problem uh, known problem and then we have a perturbation due to this cubic and fourth power so we are having now a uh, requirement of splitting the hamiltonian is achieved we have divided our hamiltonian into the perturbed and unperturbed part here in this example this unperturbed part is nothing but the simple harmonic oscillator problem and for in simple harmonic oscillator problem you can see in this red box everything is solved if you solve this energy eigenvalue problem for a simple harmonic oscillator then energy eigenvalue en is known energy eigenstate function u and x is also known which you know now that energy eigenvalue for a harmonic oscillator is n plus half h cut omega and the, as a eigenstate function we have this u and x this is a cat u and x represents the simple harmonic oscillator eigenstate function which has some normalization constant nn which has some e raised to minus half uh, alpha square x square term just to avoid the divergence at infinite uh, uh, it is the same problem like we have solved for the hydrogen atom that we also expect that the amplitude of the simple harmonic oscillator should not be infinite your oscillation should be finite that means probability of finding the oscillator at a very large distance should be zero so to achieve to uh, get this condition that your oscillator should not be found at infinite you need this type of exponential term as you increase the distance x your term will make it uh, zero and your u and x at fine, infinite distance will be zero so asymptotically your state function will be zero that requirement can be fulfilled with this uh, pre factor e raised to minus half alpha square x square. and this hn alpha x is nothing but the chromite polynomial just to remind you uh, just uh, recollect what we have uh, done for the hydrogen atom problem that hydrogen atom problem like this is also having uh, was solved using the uh, series solution technique and you know that this infinite terms in the series uh, is not required based on the requirement that at a large distance your electron in the hydrogen atom cannot be found so what we have done this series is now truncated the series is chopped down and you are having only few limited finite number of terms and you know that when series is converted into finite number of terms it is known as the polynomial so likewise here also in the example of simple harmonic oscillator your series solution technique when truncated for the finite number of terms gives you the harmonic polynomial which is also known so harmonic polynomial is known so everything is now known regarding this simple harmonic oscillator its energy eigenvalues are known its eigenstate u and x are known this u and x the eigenstate for the simple harmonic oscillator also follows the orthogonality condition so if you can see here the last uh, part uh, i have written this uh, cat u and x and bray ukx when you take a scalar product between any two eigenstate of sim simple harmonic oscillator they follow this chronical delta property they are orthogonal and they form the uh, complete set and therefore this u and x or ukx or umx this all eigenstates of a simple harmonic oscillator can be taken as the basis with which we will now expand our uh, state function for the total hemitomy. So everything regarding simple harmonic oscillator is known, which I try to write in the blue pen with the blue pen. So that is known to you. If I just look at this left box here, what is now my intention in this problem? What I want to do here is that I want to calculate the W that is the total energy when you include the effect of perturbation. That is now written as a sum of W0 means it is corresponding to the unperturbed Hamiltonian for which energy is already known, En. 
Only thing is that if I calculate W1, that is the correction introduced due to this H dash part, then I can solve this enharmonic problem up to first order. So my basic question in this equation, in the first equation, is to find out this H dash NN, that is the matrix element, or you can say the expectation value of this H dash, the uh, uh, perturbed part of Hamiltonian between two eigen cat, two eigen state U and X. So this is the matrix element or the eigen state of this H dash uh, Hamiltonian. And similarly, when I want to calculate the eigenstate, total eigenstate, it is this unx is already known. Only thing is that I need to compute this bracketed term. So ultimately, I want the correction in the energy eigenvalue and correction in the energy eigenstate, but up to first order for such an enharmonic oscillator. So please uh, just uh, remember this H0, which is exactly solvable, simple harmonic oscillator problem. And this H this that I have written as a cubic and the fourth power term, cubic term. So with this, I try to solve the problem. Uh, the expression for W1, we already know. It is something like the uh, matrix element or you can say expectation value. So this W1 is uh, known to me equation wise that I write now fully. So Bray U and X because it is H this NN. So on left, on or right, both bracket will be with a U and X. So this is a Bray UN, uh, sorry, uh, Bray UNX, H dash, uh, uh, cat UNX. This is the term which I want to evaluate. And you know that for H dash, now I have this AX cube term plus BX raised to four terms. So if I split both of them term, then I have now two separate terms, one corresponding to AX cube and another corresponding to BX raised to four term. So these are uh, the equations, term one, term two that I have to evaluate and I will do it separately. First, I will solve the cubic term, and then I will solve the fourth power term. So this is the basic equation which I, uh, I need to solve. I try to solve first my cubic equation, u and x, a x cube, u and x, correct? And you know, this a, which is the constant by name, it is known, you can see here on the uh, right panel, on a bottom, small a is known as a cubic force constant, which is nothing but related to the third derivative of the potential energy. You can see here, whatever I have written, this uh, small a is nothing but the third order of the potential derivative. And of course, this uh, multiplying factor one upon three factorial. So this small a is a constant number. So I can definitely write it outside the integration. And this term I may call as a h prime or h dash cubic or something like that. It is the first order correction due to cubic. Part. So I may write this H dash cubic or I may also equally show it as a W1 cubic. This small a constant in the expression of this UNX, this capital NN, which is nothing but your uh, normalization constant. That is also a constant term. So I can write it outside. And don't forget UNX on the left and UNX on the right both have this normalization constant. So it is the NN square which comes out. Left side UNX. Something here, you can see in this expression, nothing is a complex number. All the terms are real terms. And therefore, whether I write the, the Bray or cat, this Bray means it is the conjugate of this cat vector. But you know that there, since there are no imaginary term, so it will be all written as it is. So e raised to minus half alpha square x square from this uh, Bray unx and e raised to minus half alpha square x square which comes from the cat unx when combines that will give e raised to minus alpha square x square. So as this uh, thermite polynomial is also the real uh, function or real polynomial so I can write as a whole square of this hn alpha x and of course this x cube term I keep it as it is. So my integration from minus infinity to plus infinity is to be evaluated for this part of the term. It is the square of Fermite polynomial multiplied by this e raised to minus alpha square x square term. This by name is also known as a Gaussian term. e raised to minus alpha square x square is a uh, term known as a Gaussian. So this is a Gaussian function and multiplied by x cube. Uh, and then you have to evaluate from minus infinity to plus infinite. In fact, if I just look at this equation carefully, then there is no need to solve it because it is already solved and answer is zero. 
how? Just look at the first two term, this hn square term and e raised to minus alpha square x square. So if I now take my values of x in a small steps of dx, starting from minus infinity up to zero. So for this lower part or the lower half of the integration, where your x goes from minus infinity, minus, 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 minus up to zero. So this all the way from minus infinity to zero, your x will take negative value. Whereas the first two terms in this integration, hn square and e raised to minus alpha square, where square is coming. So even if your x is negative, but the contribution from this first two term will be positive only. But this x cube term, which is the cube, odd power and because of this odd power the contribution whatever contribution comes from this lower part of the integration that will make this entire integration negative if i go on other part of the integration from zero to positive infinite then this x cube contributes positive whereas this first two term will give the same answer because they are already the even term or the square term so what happens there is a cancellation. Whatever you get from the lower half is now compensated, is now been uh, cancelled out from the upper half part and therefore the total integration ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity will be zero. Correct? So, in fact, because of this odd even parity combination, parity means whether your function final answer will remain positive or not, that is deciding the value of integration. And if you look at this, this is the odd term, this is the even term, so even multiplied by odd. So finally, you get the odd power, odd term, and this odd parity, whenever you integrate, it gives zero. So because of this idea, you can say that the first order correction due to this cubic term, that is zero. There is no contribution, there is no correction, there is no change in energy because of this ax cube term, cubic term. Right? So, this is the first term which we have calculated for the cubic part. Similarly, now I will do it for the second part that is x raised to 4 term or the qt term, which I call as h dx qt or I can also say w1 qt. Again, the idea is same. I can put the value of u and x bray, u and x cat and b is constant. I can remove all this term, but here you can see all the terms are even. So, when I go from minus infinity to 0 and then from 0 to plus infinity, everything will be only added. It will not be compensated. It will not cancel out. So this integration will not be zero. Of course, it can't be zero because it is having the even power. It is having the even parity. And then if I go to some standard textbook where such integrations are already tabulated, like uh, there is a mathematical standard book of uh, Abramovitz. So you go to the book by Abramovitz and try to see the specific value of this Hermite polynomial for a given value of n, so hn uh, alpha x is known, e raised to minus alpha square x square, which is the Gaussian term is known, and x raised to 4. So you have a standard ready-made calculated results for such integration in a, as I've said, in a book like Abramovitz. Then you just try to see that which answer, which formula, which equation is now fitting to your equation. And when you substitute the value, when you simplify all those values, what you finally get is that this integration along with this normalization constant that you get like a square bracket. Okay? So there is no need to solve this because it is a ready-made uh, solutions available. So if I just uh, go through that book, standard textbook of mathematics, and if I put the value, my answer will come out to be like this. And of course, I multiply this B because B comes from this uh, perturbation part. So my final purity uh, correction to the energy W1 QT that is readily available. Right? So again, I just look at the situation. It is W0, which is already known. And then the first order correction. But now in a first order correction, we have a two contribution, one from the cubic part and another from the cubic part. But fortunately, for a cubic part, our contribution to the first order comes out to be zero. But the first order correction to the energy due to pure tick term that is now added. So my total energy W corrected up to first order is written as a W0, that is the unperturbed harmonic oscillator energy, which we know N plus half H cut omega, 
plus the contribution which comes from this QT contribution that I have written. Uh, but we, we should be little careful in using this equation because you can see in the expression for this uh, H prime, this N square and N and all terms are coming. It's a square term. So if I use this equation for a very large value of n, let us say I try to calculate the value of n as 10, then 10 square means it's 100. So this is quite a large term. So it should not happen that your second term, that is the corrected energy term, W1, should be greater than this. Don't forget the entire philosophy of this perturbation theory is that the unperturbed part should be the largest. Predominantly, it is the unperturbed part and only slight modification that is introduced by the perturbation. So the energy which is coming due to the perturbation should be much smaller than the unperturbed energy. So if I use this mathematical equation blindly and if I use it for the very large value of n, then it may happen that this W1 is more than W0, which is against the philosophy of the perturbation theory. So we should be careful in utilizing this equation because it is possible and valid only for a small values of n. So I have now actually obtained the total energy because of this perturbation also. Only first term if I return, it is a perfect simple harmonic oscillator which we have already exactly solved. But now due to an, this, due to an harmonic term, due to this perturbation, now I have a slight modification that I have written as a second term. So if I consider the left panel here in the graph, the energy corresponding to simple harmonic oscillator, now you can see this simple harmonic oscillator energy is now slightly shifted by the term which I have written as a W1, or if I write the explicit equation, B into three by two, uh, h cut upon m omega whole square plus n square plus n plus half this. So if your b is positive, you can see here in this expression, there is no term which can be negative. h cut can't be negative. Mass of oscillator m cannot be negative. Frequency of oscillations that is not negative. And the principal quantum number, or you can say it is the quantum number of simple harmonic oscillator that goes as a 1, 2, 3. So it cannot be negative. So depending on the choice of the sign, depending on the value of B, whether it is positive greater than zero or less than zero, this second term can be either positive or it can be negative. But that's for sure, compared to harmonic oscillator problem, now because of the second term, either your energy will be increased slightly or it can decrease slightly. If you take, if you take B equals to zero, obviously your B zero means there is no contribution from the enharmonicity there is no contribution from the harmonic term and then your uh, simple harmonic oscillator energies will be the gain. So depending on the just sign of this B term, the, don't forget B by name known as the Q-peak force constant, the last of this B that determines whether the energy will be lifted up or whether the energy will be lowered. Uh, in fact, there is something more physics uh, involved here. I will not go much in detail, but I just give you the final uh, corollary or I give the final remark that if you take B equals to uh, negative value, B when takes the less than zero negative value, then it is not possible to form the stable structure because when your system is slightly shifting in energy, from left panel you can see which I have shown here now this energy is slightly above and this energy states are slightly below in quantum mechanics the shifting of energy state or system go from one energy state to another energy state is possible only when the energy states themselves are existing I even in, in, a, in our class of statistical mechanics we will see more fundamental things in quantum mechanics is the energy states. So unless and until you have energy states existing, you cannot have a transition. If states are available, if states are possible, if states are existing, then and then system can go, can make a transition from one state to another. If states themselves are not existing, then how can a system go from one uh, energy state to another energy state? 
so with that idea when we do some a little more physics little more mathematics and then we can prove that if we have a b negative the small b value is uh, less than zero then we can prove that such energy states are not existing if such a negative energy states are not existing lower energy states are not existing so obviously then system cannot go lower to this uh, simple harmonic oscillator energy so with this idea with this remark you are now left with only one possibility that your curtic force constant that is small b is always greater than zero and what happens that compared to simple harmonic oscillator energy state now because of this quadratic term because of this curtic term because of this perturbation your energy level gets shifted it is now been raised it has been now uh, increased in the energy levels so we can see that as a direct application of this uh, uh, perturbation is that we can now shift the energy levels from one energy state now we can go slightly above to the higher energy states and this is the one example which illustrates which actually explains the effect of perturbation it's not only one example so there are plenty of such situations where you are in a, uh, you are able to split your hamiltonian into the perturbed part and unperturbed part and for unperturbed part if you have ready made solutions available then that unperturbed part can be considered as a h0 and remaining the part we can consider as the perturbation just i try to make a list of certain things which we are in fact using we will be solving some of them but it is known to you the first which we have already solved the problem of an harmonic oscillator if someone asks where such a problem can be observed i have already mentioned like in the case of atomic spectra or diatomic uh, uh, spectra or dielectric molecules like uh, when you want to study the rotational spectra or the vibrational spectra of say co uh, carbon uh, monoxide gas or you want to study say for a homogeneous molecule n2 uh, nitrogen gas if you want to study what are the vibrational spectra you can study with this idea this is exactly what we have done correct right? or if you want to study the different energy states of a hydrogen atom or hydrogenic atom when they are placed in electric field then this external electric field will work as the perturbation so your energy states will be now slightly shifted if not electric field you can also employ some magnetic field and you all know that whenever there is a shifting of energy levels due to the presence of uniform magnetic field you the phenomenon is known as a the effect is known as a zeeman effect anomalous zeeman effect and the you know say normal zeeman effect that you have studied not only this even if you consider the relativistic part we will see in the uh, in the third sem when we consider the relativistic uh, on the mechanics then you can see that all those uh, hydrogen type problems they when are subjected to relativistic correction then this relativity will work as a small perturbation so their energy levels are slightly shifted so you can see there is a list long list of the problems where this perturbation theory can be applicable and entire spectroscopy i can say with the brevity that entire spectroscopy can be studied in terms of perturbation theory the only requirement is that your perturbation should be small compared to the unperturbed part if it is large for example if you just illuminate if you just uh, use the laser uh, on a system and if laser beam is a very intense very powerful then such a perturbation theory will not be applicable no need to say any experiment requires some agency like in the case of the stark effect and zeeman effect what is the role played by electric and magnetic field what they are doing here we know that electric field the application of electric field you are now using this additional external electric field to probe to understand the system so this electric field works as the external agency through which you want to investigate the system similarly magnetic field is the external agency through which you want to study the system similarly you may slightly increase the temperature so this increase in temperature this effect of thermal energy additional external thermal energy is to slightly disturb the system so any experiment which tries to compute any physical quantity requires any always 
external agency and this external energy external agency if it is small in magnitude can be considered as a perturbation and therefore the perturbation theory is a very very powerful tool to explain to understand the any experimental results okay so this is the first order correction and its uh, application that we uh, try to understand so in the next part Uh, say maybe in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes we try to understand that how uh, we can go beyond the first order and we can actually calculate now the second order energy correction again for the second order theory let me go back to the fundamental three equations perturbation equations you can see this three equations first is zeroth order term which is always exactly solvable first order correction that is equation number 2 that we have solved based on that we have seen one example now i am going to this third equation nothing but the second order perturbation theory and again i will collect this uh, two blue lines on one left side this uh, red wavy lines and this uh, red and blue lines all together so i am making a group of this equation so third equation Uh, that is my target this third equation second order perturbation theory that i try to solve now okay, so i go to um, the equation again you can see this v2 v2 the second order state function that i have uh, kept on left side and the first order and the zeroth order term that i have written on the uh, right hand side you can see out of which this uh, tick mark terms the like w0 or w1 or v1 or v0 they are already known don't forget we have already solved the first order term and because of first order term we have now what is w1 we have what is w0 we have what is the state function corrected up to first order v1 and the zeroth order function v0 this everything is known just to remind you v0 we always write as a cat um w0 unperturbed part that we write as em and for w1 and v1 we have obtained the equation so this tick mark terms are already known this circle part a red circle part which uh, below which i have written a question mark that is to be evaluated i go in the very similar fashion what we have done for the first order i write my second order term second order eigen state function i can expand it in terms of this unperturbed um here like this and then the coefficient cn2 which i have to obtain and don't forget like in the first order term this cn2 will be of the order of second order so the, it is much smaller than even cn1 correct right? so this v2 i can expand in terms of this u and then again i will take now scalar product from the left by uk Uh, you can see i am following the same procedure mathematically there is no as such any change right so from the left this bray uk will multiply so from this left side here the bray uh, in the first equation now from this left side uk will multiply and then h0 when operates on un and all those procedure which we have already done i can follow right so this equation when i try to solve i will come across some chronical delta properties you can see this equations so i try to solve this equation and then i combine uh, the first two term in fact this term after h0 operates it gives e and un so this u k and un will give delta k and here also this w0 i can write as em this u k un so this first two terms on the left side that i try together so what i have is cn2 which i have written common and then this type of term you can see this everything i have written here just to make a separate that this term uk um whereas everywhere else it is uk un just to separate it kn m i have written this term with a red color line just to remind me that this delta is between state uk and state um whereas the first term on right hand side and the left hand side it is state u k and u n and always we focus on the energy part first so first is always to obtain this w2 and in order to get w2 out of this equation i must take k equals to m so i write k equals to m but not n correct so when i say k is not n 
this left hand side is 0 first term on right hand side is 0 a equals to m so it will be 1 so it is only w2 and don't be in hurry to write this thing because this is the matrix element it is the sandwich between state uk and un for perturbed hamiltonian h prime so that is written as h this an it will be as it is and from that i take this w2 uh, i'll make a w2 subject then my second order correction to energy w2 is ready this term i can take on the left hand side and don't forget for the expression of cn1 we have already obtained this part h this nm upon en minus em so instead of this cn1 i can use this expression so the expression for w2 is red if you just look at these two matrix elements h this nm which comes from cn1 and h this mn which is already there here if i consider my h this the perturbed part of hamiltonian to be a hermitian if it is self adjoint then this h this nm whether you write or h this nm star you write it will be same so it is something like the modulus square h this nm h this mn and don't forget conjugate with uh, transpose gives the hermitian so mn here you can see mn is now changed to nm but if it is the real matrix hermitian matrix then they both are same so this two terms together i can write as a modulus h this nm so my second order correction to energy is ready here prime indicates you are not allowed to take n equals to m you can see here it is m is not allowed to take n otherwise you can see from the denominator also if n and m are equal then this term will uh, make it uh, it will diverge the term so this w2 cannot be calculated for n equals to m. this is when your k equals to m but not n now if you reverse the situation if k is n but not m then this red color delta will be zero first term on the right side and the left side it will be delta term will be one and from that you can make now your ck2 subject so you can take this as a bracket ek minus em on our uh, right side and then you can write ck2 correct so in the next slide i will take this on right side this term i am writing first so what i'll have is the expression like this don't forget this is when your k is equals to n but not m and then i put the value of cn1 this part cn1 on the first term i can write the expression for ck1 here so all those term i can substitute when i write with the cn1 so obviously in the expression for cn1 h des nm will come but if i write for ck1 then it will be h des km will come so this red circle reminds me that i have written this term for coefficient ck whereas in the first i have written with n all that term i can substitute so my ck2 will be red there is one small technical term that i should introduce and for that let me go back to my the first order correction uh, equations where if you just remember that here also while writing the ck1 you were not taking the value of m you can see here you are allowed only to take k equals to m but not m but if someone wants that no i will also want to include the effect of k equals to m term if k is equals to m then corresponding coefficient will be written as cm instead of cn now it will be written as cm but on the argument based on uh, say you know, phase factor we can prove that this cm1 comes out to be zero and therefore we had not written any contribution from a term k equals to m because the corresponding coefficient cm1 is zero so because coefficient is zero automatically the state function uh, contribution of uh, the state function for k equals to m will also be zero so this coefficient which we have obtained cm1 that uh, came zero and therefore we have not mentioned in the expression for the v1 but similar thing is not possible similar argument does not hold as it is 
in the case of second order correction. Here, when you take k equals to m, you can see here k is not m. But even if you take k equals to m, then this cm2 is not coming zero. Like previously, we have cm1 is zero, but cm2 is giving now some contribution. Okay. Right? So if I use this expression for cm2, k equals to m value, now total expression for a v2, and don't forget v2 is something cn2 multiplied by this state un, that is what I am writing. So now ck everything plus k equals to m, this part when I write my total expression for the state function v2 will be written like this. Okay? So basically, this is the second order correction to the state function v2 and this box here w2 is the second order correction to the energy eigen value. So we have now both uh, order correction, first order correction to energy eigen value, first order correction to the energy eigen state function and similarly now today we have obtained the second order energy eigen value and the second order uh, uh, eigen state function. So both are now uh, readily available. Uh, next time, in fact, uh, we will go with the another uh, type of perturbation theory. Uh, not exactly the type of perturbation theory, but uh, another case for the perturbation theory. Whatever energy states we have considered, whether we have applied a first order correction or whether we try to apply the second order correction, we assume that the energy states are non-degenerate. Non-degenerate means corresponding to each and every eigenstate, we have only one energy. <clears throat> energy and energy states are unique, single, one-to-one -one relation. But if you have energy same, but states are many. For example, if you have one energy eigenvalue, but there are four states, all of them are giving, say, the same energy, then you can say that these four states are degenerate states, and the amount of degeneracy is fourfold. So we now want to extend this theory, perturbation theory, for a degenerate case. This is only for the non-degenerate case. So how we obtain the um, uh, energy corrections and the uh, energy state correction for the degenerate case, that we will see next time. So I, I stop here for today's lecture that the first order correction and its applications once we have realized then we can go to the second order correction to the energy and second order correction to the energy against state that we try to develop. This is all mathematics. When we will take the example, you can better feel it, better you can realize that yes, how these equations can be handy, how these equations can be useful in solving the actual problems in physics. Right? So we will also see the examples based on the second order correction for the energy. But before that, uh, next time, I will consider the another case, rather than having the energy states non-degenerate, we will consider the case for the degenerate uh, energy states. So, with this, uh, I think I stop for today here, and I just wait for a while. If you have any uh, queries, inquiries, uh, doubts, I can answer those questions. But before that, let me just uh, switch off this recording so we can uh, talk freely. Right? So let me just stop recording.